So cards on the table, I uploaded this video a couple days ago with a sponsorship from a company that I rapidly learned, thanks to all of you, has been accused of creating an environment of sexual harassment and abuse. I didn't know that at the time when I accepted the sponsorship, but that's no excuse. I should have looked into the company more than I did. It was wildly irresponsible of me not to, and I'm sorry for any harm that it caused. I took that original video down and ended the partnership with that brand, uh, but I did put a lot of time and energy into this video and I do want to show it to you all because I think it is a good video. So I'm uploading it again right now, sponsor free. And the reason I bring all this up is because I do genuinely want to thank you for your feedback and for holding me accountable and to also note that this video and this video's thumbnail are now dripping with about seven layers of unintended irony. Yikes. Like I said, I think it's a good video and I hope that you enjoy it, but there's just no denying that there are going to be parts of this that might be a little awkward in hindsight. But I probably can't delay this video forever. So once again, thank you and let's get to it. So I spend a lot of time working on the thumbnails for my YouTube videos. Sometimes I spend entire days of work trying to get the colors just right and make sure the images I use are attention grabbing and overall just trying out different ideas until I think it's good enough, I guess. And if looking at my YouTube analytics has taught me anything, it's that I'm an ugly crier. <laughs> <laughs> and that a lot of you who watch my videos are already subscribed, which is great, thank you for doing that, but it also means that I'm not reaching many new people, at least not as many as I could be. And the way to reach new viewers is by making eye-catching thumbnails. They're the very first thing that people see before they decide to click on a video, and clearly, I need help designing some. You know, something that can really pull people in. And I think I know where to look. Ah, uh, I love comic books, but there's no denying that they are weird sometimes, especially superhero comics where physics is constantly breaking and the multiverse is unraveling. And there's also this big evil starfish, which honestly feels incredibly derivative. SpongeBob did it first. 40 years later. I got you now, SpongeBob! Honestly though, I love the wacky world of superheroes. The setting is malleable enough that writers can craft even the goofiest worlds into a serious setting to tell nuanced stories of ethics, politics, and culture. But then there are Silver Age comics. Ah yes, the Silver Age. Fitting somewhere between the late 50s and early 70s, this was the era of superhero comics that really just tried to one-up themselves with how increasingly bonkers each issue could be. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of really good stuff in this era. I'm not trying to discount any of it, but it is worth noting that they can be pretty wild sometimes. Publishers wanted to sell as many copies as they could, and the best way to do that was well, just by making a really good story, obviously. But that's, that's hard. I don't, I don't know how to do that. It's too much work. The easier way to sell comics was by drawing up covers that were so outlandish and so completely baffling that people needed to buy them just to figure out what was going on? By far the quintessential Silver Age comic, and my personal favorite, is Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen. I mean, there's just no comparison. Every issue, Jimmy Olsen, a photographer for the Daily Planet and personal friend of Superman, finds himself in another impossibly bizarre scenario that just feels like a parody of what people who don't like comics think comics are. For example, I have absolutely no idea what's happening on this cover. Superman is holding up the wet clothes of Clark Kent saying, confess that you killed him. And Jimmy apparently is guilty of killing Clark Kent and is like, now I have to kill kill Superman with a gamma bomb. Why does he have that? In this one, Jimmy gets real stretchy and then his head gets stuck in the phantom zone somehow. Jimmy Olsen, the human porcupine, it says. Apparently it's because he's the victim of a magic spell that even Superman can't undo. What did you get up to, Jimmy? And then in this one, Jimmy uh, switches minds with an ape somehow. And I don't even think that's the first time that happened. In this one, it seems pretty ordinary because Jimmy Olsen is just giving Superman a haircut. But if you look at the comic that, that Superman is reading, it's this comic. He's reading this comic. And on that cover, he's also reading this comic. So it's, it just keeps, it's, it's infinite Jimmy's. 
It's infinite jimmies. You get the point. These are the only comic books that I collect physically because they just haven't made better comics since these came out. Every story is beautiful nonsense and I love them all. And maybe I need to take a page from these Silver Age comics because the pages are they're falling off already, so. That is a good question, though. If I study these comic books from the 1960s, could I learn how to make and market an eye-catching YouTube thumbnail in 2021? Well, I mean, if you're watching this, then I guess it worked. So let's see how I got here. Well, gang, weather's getting hotter and it is Pride Month, so this bi boy is going back to unbuttoning his shirts a little too far for your comfort level. You're welcome. How are you doing, you wonderful nerds? Scott here, and there's a very silly and kind of hilarious reason why some comic books from the 60s have this particular aesthetic of being just off the wall bonkers. The Silver Age was an era where comics publishers, especially DC Comics, would work outside in. Editors would pitch an idea for a wacky cover and then leave it for the artist and writer to figure out what the story inside of the comic was supposed to be. You know, just kind of like, here's a weird idea, make it make sense. That is why the stories in the pages of these comics are so incomprehensible and honestly, a bit of a letdown sometimes. The covers were creatively bananas. They made the reader ask a lot of questions and those questions are exciting. Finding out the answers to those questions when you realize that the answers weren't planned from the start makes the whole experience end on a disappointing note. These truly are the J.J. Abrams of comic books. The covers are the true glory of these comics. They were made to get attention and didn't care what the story was inside of the comic beyond that point. They were effectively clickbait, but they were delightfully whimsical clickbait, and I want to replicate that for views. As I said, uh, almost dropped it. I collect jimmies. I know that the box that I keep them in says Ant-Man, uh, but if you look right there, you can see that I have expertly taped over the box to read Jay Olson so that no one is confused. Oh yeah, that's the other thing uh, is that I don't really refer to these as like uh, Jimmy Olsen comics or issues of Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen. I, I just kind of refer to them as Jimmy's as in this is a box of Jimmy's. And you're just gonna have to get behind that or you're gonna have a really rough time with this video. Okay, let's go ahead and open up Photoshop. And uh, first things first, I think I need a good color palette to work with. Now, as you've seen, these comics use very loud, contrasty colors. Because of Superman's presence, there's obviously a lot of red and blue, but Jimmy himself tends to wear these sort of green and purpley magenta hues. Which is interesting because as we've established in many previous videos, those are colors that are typically reserved for villains, not heroes. And you know what? That actually does make a lot of sense for Jimmy. Even though he is Superman's pal, he's often the unintentional cause of disaster and harm that Superman has to you know, swoop in and set right. Almost as if Jimmy Olsen's mere existence is an antagonizing force upon everything he touches. Now, I don't have clothes that vibrant, uh, and every party and Halloween store that I went to is out of Joker costumes. I'm sure that's not concerning. But I do have this sort of periwinkle flowery shirt and this olive jacket, although in this lighting, you can't really tell what colors they are. I just really wanted to go for the bisexual lighting aesthetic. Either way, I'll just tweak these colors in post to make them even more lively and gaudy. Now the primary background color for these comics ranges pretty much the entire rainbow, but I found that my collection usually deals in these warm yellowy tones or pure white, which just kind of looks yellow these days because the comics are very old and the paper they printed them on was bad. I think I'm going to go the yellow route. Seems to work pretty good for my buddy Captain Midnight. So with the background color sorted, let's tackle 
The Foreground. I've spent the last week or so studying these comics, and while I only have around 30 to 40 feral jimmies, and they're mostly before Jack Kirby came in and got his stink all over them, I think I can confidently sort the themes of these covers into three categories. Category one, weakness and vulnerability. Now this mostly comes into play with Jimmy uncovering a lot of different types of kryptonite and exposing Superman to it either accidentally or purposefully. So like in this cover, for example, Jimmy pulls back a curtain that has silver kryptonite behind it. And I guess not even Superman knows because he's like, how you've exposed me to silver kryptonite. How is that different from green, red, gold, blue or white? There's a lot of kryptonite, man. And Jimmy very menacing is like, ha ha, silver kryptonite will affect you in a way you'll never forget. Prepare for the surprise of your life, Superman. And again, since whoever came up with this idea did not care about what was inside, it was it's a surprise to them as well, whatever silver kryptonite. It's a surprise to all of us. Here's a comic where Superman is just like dead on the moon. The Riddle of Kryptonite Plus, which I only assume is a streaming service. And I love that the astronauts are just not at all bothered with the corpse of Superman. They're just like busy scooping up rocks. Like, oh man, Superman's dead, that sucks. And cool looking rocks though. But Superman is not the only one with a weakness. Sure, his kryptonite is kryptonite, but Jimmy's is uh, j just about any woman. So here's one, I guess, where Jimmy Olsen is being seduced by some sort of alien woman who's like trying to get him to come to her planet. And he's like, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, let's do it. I have no questions. This theme of vulnerability also extends to guest stars. For example, one of my favorite covers of all time. We've got Jimmy Olsen and Aquaman dying of thirst in a desert as Superman holds a pitcher of water above them. Survival of the fittest between Aquaman, king of the ocean, an actual superhero, and then Jimmy Olsen, who's just some guy. I don't know who's gonna win this one, it's a toss up. But I think this category is an important takeaway. Superheroes are powerful figures. Superman might be the most recognizable and most super of all of them. So consistently showing the Man of Steel weakened on the front covers of these Jimmys does get your attention. But the fact that they do the same maneuver for Jimmy as well shows that you don't even have to be the biggest, most popular person on the block for people to care. In fact, showing a little vulnerability might get people to care. I have noticed that the videos where I show a lot of openness about my struggles are ones that really resonate with people. In fact, I've found myself thinking recently that the goal of my channel is to examine media through curiosity and vulnerability, and I'm glad I can be sincere and honest like that with you all. I don't intend to ever stop making videos like that. Uh, but this is not one of those videos. I'm just trying to make clickbait here. So I'm thinking I might just throw a pic of myself in here looking all sad or anxious or something. We're gonna make those clothes pop a bit more with some green and some magenta. And you know what? Maybe we're gonna add a little tear emoji just to make sure that people know that I'm, I'm very seriously sad here. And hey, we're off to a good start. Kind of looks like a YouTube apology thumbnail. I feel like honing into that style of content is a sure way to get tons of views. And then I'll go viral and make lots of money. Yeah, so this joke doesn't look uh, great in hindsight, huh? Uh, let, let's move on. Category two, money. There's a lot of these issues that feature money on the cover. Uh, sometimes Jimmy really loves money. For example, uh, in this one, he sells out Superman's secret identity for money. Uh, in this issue, he's fishing money out of the ocean uh, for some reason. But it's not like Jimmy consistently loves money either because uh, there's this issue where he's joined some sort of protest where one of the signs is we hate money. I thought you were my pal, Jimmy. Why have you joined this hippie gang against me? It's an actual line somebody wrote. Sometimes Jimmy is pretty indifferent to money, just kind of has a lot of it, not sure what to do with it. For example, uh, this comic, where they refer to Jimmy Olsen as the Midas of Metropolis, which is very funny because a couple issues earlier, 
he literally did have a golden touch and they didn't call him the Midas of Metropolis here. You know, money makes sense though. YouTube keeps recommending me this channel that I've never watched a single video from called Mr. Beast. Yeah, so I don't really intend to ever watch one of these videos, but based on the thumbnails alone, everything seems to be about buying things or like challenges that reward a lot of money. This one here actually is about giving people $1 million, but only a minute to spend it, uh, which is very similar to an issue of Jimmy Olsen. Yeah, tens of millions of views on these videos too, good lord. So I think the takeaway here is I'm gonna go ahead and Photoshop some money in here, maybe throw in a couple dollar signs here and there. And in case that wasn't clear enough, how about a little word balloon that says, I love money, just so we're all on the same page. Uh, me. Category three, Jimmy's obsession with Superman's secret identity. There's one where Jimmy is just ripping off Clark Kent's clothes in public to prove that he's Superman. Can you imagine how embarrassing that would be if he was wrong? I love this one. So Jimmy has a cardboard cutout of Superman and then he has a second cardboard cutout of just a regular business suit. And he's like putting it over the first cardboard cutout to be like, look, if you dress Superman up, like Clark Kent, they look like Clark Kent. Oh, but here's the real twist. He's not just doing it in public, he's doing it in front of the mob. Why is Jimmy helping out the mob? I don't know, I'm gonna read it. I'm not gonna read it. Uh, here's one where Superman is like changing in a telephone booth into like back into Clark Kent, but it, Clark Kent doesn't come out. It's Jimmy Olsen comes out and uh, another Jimmy Olsen is like watching this and he's like, whoa, is Superman's secret identity is me? Trust no one, not even yourself. This one is one of my favorites just because of how bizarre it is. Uh, so Jimmy Olsen has uncovered the secret identity of Superman, obviously, and uh, he's trying to tell people about it, but Superman's defense to, to keep his identity a secret is by claiming that Jimmy Olsen is clinically insane and he puts him in a straitjacket and takes him to an asylum. That is horrible. That is one of the worst things that Superman could do. Wow. I probably can't translate this category in a perfect one for one. It's a little too specific to Superman. Plus everyone already knows that Superman and Clark Kent are two different people and it's weird that Jimmy keeps insisting otherwise. But I think what I can take away from this category is that these covers tap into this juicy drama of exposing something secret about a public figure. Superman wants to keep his identity private. So when we see Jimmy try to unravel it time and time again, or see the lengths that Superman would go to try and keep it covered up, there's inherent drama and tension, but it's drama that raises questions. Jimmy is supposed to be Superman's pal. Why do they keep constantly attacking each other over this secret? Alternatively, why doesn't Jimmy just leave it alone and accept that Clark Kent and Superman are two different people? Because it's immediately captivating to see the secrets of well-known figures publicly called out. Drama channels exist on YouTube for a reason, unfortunately, but it does mean that all I really have to do is add the word exposed at the bottom of this, and look, we already got this category covered. I think I've accidentally made a Philip DeFranco thumbnail. Like, even just like the, the arm thing, you know? Does he still do that arm thing? I haven't seen Philip DeFranco in years. Does he still do that? Where he just kind of goes like, oh. he like looks at the camera with his arm here and he just goes, oh. It's got, it's all in the eyebrows, like the, oh. <laughs> What am I doing? Okay, moving on. So those are the three categories, but we're not done yet because there is a secret fourth category that runs under all of the other categories, like a, a sewer full of the most baffling bonkers ideas that the other comics would be too cowardly to embrace. Secret fourth category, the most baffling bonkers ideas that any other comic would be too cowardly to embrace. Now I described these comics as beautiful nonsense earlier, and that's just about the best descriptor. Here's a taste of what I'm talking about. So once again, we've got Porcupine Jimmy, we got Jimmy swapping in minds with an ape. We got Jimmy giving Superman a haircut and reading about it at the same time. Here's a, a written and printed comic book that promises to show off a new song and dance, two things that would, it would seem like it would be very hard to do 
within this medium. It's called the Krypton Crawl, and it claims to be bouncier than the Beatles and more electrifying than Elvis, which is why we all still talk about this, and we don't talk about whoever those other musicians are today. And this is uh, just a comic that I really don't understand. So to preface this, there is a celebrity named Don Rickles, I only know who they are because they voice Mr. Potato Head in the Toy Story movies. You uncultured swine! But this cover is like, hey, what if there were two Don Rickles? <laughs> are you ready for this? Two Rickles! This looks to be just like a caricature of Don Rickles and it's signed to my dear friend, Attila the Hun. One of the weirder ones for sure. Thanks, Jack. Anyway, this category is the secret sauce that gives Jimmy's their own brand of confounding amusement. Take a look at the kind of stuff that Marvel was publishing at the tail end of 1969. X-Men, Hulk, Iron Man, classic superhero fodder. Heck, it was the same year they introduced Falcon into Captain America comics. But more importantly, it was the year they introduced the second character named Wizard in Avengers number 69. And I'll remind you that it was also the year 69 when it happened. Everything about that fact that you just learned is nice. I'd argue that's the most notable thing to happen in 1969, and it was also the same year that we landed on the moon, which I only remember because of that musical episode of Even Steven. We went to the moon in 1969. That's when they made a landing that was lunar. And if it sounds like I'm getting off track and just talking nonsensically, I'm just trying to channel my inner Jimmy Olsen. Because this is the kind of stuff that Jimmy was up to that same year. And I warn you, what you're about to see might be the weirdest comic cover you have ever seen. Jimmy, what kind of pal are you? How can you laugh at this heartbreaking movie? Don't ask questions, just keep bawling, Superman. Every teardrop is precious to me. Man, of course Superman still looks hot when he's crying. That's not fair. <laughs> Just to be clear, this comic to me is so wild that I broke the one rule that I have for acquiring Jimmy's just to get this. Normally, I only buy these comic books when I see them out in the wild at a comic shop or at a convention. Obviously, I've not been able to go to one of those in a while, but I had to get this one in person because I didn't think you'd believe me that it exists. So this is the one Jimmy I have ever and will ever acquire through uh, ebay.com. So my thumbnail right now, it's good. But it can be better. You need something completely off the wall, next level bonkers, just to round it out. And when in doubt, go to the old comic book classic. An evil starfish. And we're just gonna crank up the saturation a bit to match these vibrant 1960s comic book vibes. And you know what? I'd say we have a completed thumbnail. I think that's looking pretty good. A perfect translation of these 60 year old Jimmy Olsen comics into modern YouTube clickbait. And I think that's really what's interesting about this to me the most. The content that people consume over the decades has definitely changed, but the way that people try to grab attention using emotional gut reactions to drama and curiosity through a vibrant contrasting color palette, it's more or less the same all these decades later. I may have amped up the weirdness a little bit too far in this particular thumbnail, but I mean, hey, you clicked on it. So now all I have to do is do uh, make the video part of the video that you clicked on. So I did not think this far ahead. Oh man, I pulled, I did a J.J. Abrams, didn't I? Thank you so much for watching whatever this video was. I'm gonna be constantly checking the analytics on this video to see how this thumbnail is performing, if it really is getting me more clicks than usual. Maybe this is my most viewed video now. I don't know. If you're invested in the journey to see what happens and you want updates on these analytics, I'm gonna be doing a live stream next week right here on this channel discussing this video and 
everything that I know of behind the scenes once it's published. So make sure that you are subscribed to the channel and hit that bell so you get notifications so you don't miss anything. And you can tune in for the follow-up data. And you know, a thumbnail is just half of the equation to get people to click. The other half, of course, is the title. Now, I workshopped this video's title in the NerdSync Discord server, uh, which you can get access to if you support me on Patreon. I also upload my new videos a week early on Patreon so you can see them before anybody else. And of course, there's this big wall of scrolling names that you can get your name added to, just like Amanda Trisdale, Christopher Lang, Donna Bark, Edwin Latour, Eric Totoro Pato, Everett Parrott, Havelox Miggles, Jonathan and Megan Pearson, Jonathan Lenowski, and the rest of the wonderful nerds who support me over at patreon.com slash nerdsync. Link in the description. If you want to watch me talk more about Superman, here's a video I did all about how his black costume in the Justice League film doesn't make much sense. Or click or tap right here to see something YouTube's algorithm recommends. Until next time, my name is Scott, reminding you to read between the panels and grow smarter through comics. See ya. Hopefully I was in focus, I couldn't tell. <laughs>